Oh, this is a very new type of Twitter feed we have here. Okay, not, not enough bouncing. Not very, not bouncing. That's what she said. Okay. Hi, I'm Brad Templeton, the chair for networking and computing here at Singularity University. Now, we're answering questions from Twitter about the topics we cover here at SU. I'm going to check out Twitter, see what people are asking. <whistles> Wait a minute, that's a... Uh, must be a new interface that Twitter has. They're sending an actual bird to me here. Well, this one comes from Jay Crin, and they're asking, are there any projects for driverless cargo transportation? Well, first of all, uh, I hate the term driverless car, which is a term that a lot of people use. I think it's a bit like horseless carriage, um, and that we use it today, but it'll go away because just as the fact that there's no horse is the least important thing about a car, the fact that there's no driver is the least important thing about these machines. And this is particularly true when they are carrying cargo, because it's actually easier to build a robot that can carry cargo than it is to build something that could safely move around on man and carry people. Um, for one thing, you can't kill a pizza. And that means you don't need airbags, and uh, you don't need crumple zones, and all these things. You, ha you can't hit anybody, but you're not in a hurry, you're not as heavy, you don't have to go on the main roads. So it's actually a much easier problem. So yeah, I think that we're going to see driverless transportation for goods in things, small robots the size of suitcases, maybe even before we see cars out there. Now, that'll mean you'll be able to get anything in 30 minutes, not just a pizza. Right? You will be able to order six pairs of shoes and they'll come to your door and you'll try them on and send back five of them and it will cost very little money. That's going to change how retailing works. It's going to change our cities, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, but it's definitely coming. Wow, these, uh, these tweets are getting more and more frequent here. Uh, let's take a look at what we're getting asked today. Um, this is at Dordizio who asks, will people be resistant to not being able to speed? That's a really complex question. So first of all, most people don't know this, but for example, Google has a car out there which drives itself and it won't speed on its own, but it has a little dial in it. And you can turn the dial up to whatever speed you want to go and that includes going faster than the speed limit, which is really exactly the same as the cruise control that you already have. So in that case, what we're doing is letting the people make the decision about whether they're going to break the law or any kind of judgment of that sort. And that makes sense. We don't really want the cars deciding to break the law, but for better or worse, we do still reserve that right to people. Now, a more difficult question is the fact that in the United States, everyone speeds. Right? And if you go out to the highway here and the speed limit will say 65 miles an hour, and everyone is going 75, even 80 miles an hour. And so a car that's going only 65 will actually be an impediment to traffic. And there are other countries in the world, like in France, they have an auto route and the speed limit is 130 kilometers an hour, which is about 80 miles an hour, and very few people speed because they actually do ticket you when you go over, and that's, that's a more rational system. But if we find that we have to have people speeding because everyone else does, and the programmers aren't willing to program their cars to speed, we actually might have to answer that in the law. We might have to normalize our speed limits, match them to what people actually do, or even say that these cars, because they've proven themselves safe at the higher speed, we have to let them actually do that. Now, this may be some time before we're ready to change the law that way. And we have received a tweet here from at Verhagen. Sorry if I butchered your name. But he's asking, what do you predict the dominant use model will be for these cars? Rental, purchase, perhaps social? Well, that's interesting because I think there's going to be lots of different use models and there will be people who continue to buy regular cars. There are people who buy a self-driving car and they have it serve only them. There are going to be people who give up one or both of their cars in a family and use taxi style service, rental style service all the time. There'll even be people, I think, who buy the cars and then when they're not using them, they let the car go out and make money for them and that way they can afford a bit of a nicer car. Now, these and many other business models will be out there. It's very hard to predict today which one will win because I think there are people of every type out there. I think in the long run, if you look at a city like Manhattan, for example, it seems that at least in dense areas like that, there will be a tendency towards the taxi model, towards borrowing them. Now, in addition, you asked about vehicles being social. One nice thing about when a car is summoned to you is you can say how many people you have traveling. And that means that when you're alone, it might be a very inexpensive and small little car, the kind that nobody buys today, a few people buy. And then when you've got five or six people 
absolutely party mobile, right? It's, uh, it's efficient, it's effective. All six, seven, eight of you could be a van, you name it, something you'd never afford on your own. Um, and you'll have a great time and uh, you'll probably even get to program the tunes yourself. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. So thanks for all your tweets. That's all for this session. And so for now, we're going to bid adieu to our little bird here. Thank <laughs> you.